Welcome to People and Profit. I'm Kate Moody. Today, I'm pleased to be joined by Jayati Ghosh, Professor of Economics at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and newly appointed co-chair of the Independent Commission for the Reform of International Corporate Taxation. Thank you so much for being with us on France 24 today. That organization that you've recently become the co-chair of is calling for emergency taxes on multinational corporations to help deal with the inflation crisis and growing government debt. Explain a little bit what you're pushing for. So, in fact, we have been arguing for more than six years now, really, that you have to tax multinational corporations the same way you would tax your domestic companies, which is to say, don't allow them to get away with shifting profits to other jurisdictions and not pay the tax where it's been earned. And so it's easy to do that. It's easy to do that if you treat a multinational as one company and say that my economy deserves this share of your total profits to be taxed depending on sales, revenues, employment, assets in my country. And you, so you can have a formula that allows every country to apply the same tax rate to multinationals that they do for their own companies. It's a very sensible procedure, but it was never accepted until quite recently. And why is that? Why this shift? This shift has happened because base erosion and profit shifting, as it's called, which is that multinationals shift to all the low tax places. Ireland, uh, Jersey, Jersey and Guernsey in the U and some states in the US, they shift to all of these areas and say, well, you know, all our profits are actually made there. So even though you are 20% of our revenues, we don't get, get any profits from your country. This realization that they're just using these arm's length rules to avoid paying taxes is what made even the OECD realize that something has to be done. And the G7 and the G20 went along with this and put in place a process to try and get at least the multinational corporations to be fairly sharing, paying what they're supposed to pay. Now, we'll come back to this question of the OECD framework deal in just a minute, but I want to ask you specifically about the global energy crisis. Uh, energy prices are skyrocketing for households and businesses around the world, and one of the solutions that some governments are putting forward is the possibility of a windfall tax on energy giants. Is that the right solution, and are governments really going about it the right way, do you think? Well, to do a windfall profit tax is a no-brainer. You cannot have massive profiteering in the middle of a humanitarian catastrophe, which is really what's happening. So that's absolutely essential and kind of obvious. The difficulty is how do you establish how much is windfall? How much is normal? How much is, you know, be a super normal? It's very complicated. So what we're suggesting is make it a gradated profit uh, tax, which is to say the higher your taxes and the greater they are above previous years, the higher your tax rate. But then... If we look, for example, at the United Kingdom, which is one of the countries that's really in the depths of an energy crisis, the new prime minister has said that she's not in favor of a windfall tax on energy companies because she's worried that it will affect their willingness to invest and create jobs in the years to come. How would you react to that? It's a very foolish position. This has never happened. And furthermore, all of the incentives given to companies to make them invest more have typically never worked. In India in 2019, our finance minister gave a massive tax cut to large corporations saying this will generate investment. No, nothing happened. They just got more profits. That's all. <laughs> On a wider scale, we've had years of gridlock on this idea of a minimum corporate tax rate. There was a breakthrough in the last 12 months or so. More than 130 countries signed on to this OECD framework, uh, which would agree to impose a minimum rate of 15% tax on multinational corporations. Do you believe that international deal will really be implemented, and when? Well, you know, first of all, it's a really watered down deal from what we hoped for. We had been asking for 25%, which is the median of all corporate tax rates. Most developing countries have higher profit taxes than 25%. But the United States government and Janet Yellen had suggested 21%, which is still okay, which is still reasonable. It's got watered down to 15%, which is close to the profit uh, taxes of tax havens like Ireland. So it's much, much lower. Now, even that is being contested which suggests that there is no appetite for large countries which are very successfully lobbied by their big corporations. So not necessarily a game changer in your point of view. Right now it's stuck. Does that mean nothing will change? No, because if a few large countries implement it, that already changes, if you like, you know, the, the state of play. What about countries that haven't signed on to that, that say, no, we're just going to go our own way and perhaps continue to be tax havens? 
actually, the interesting thing is that the countries that have refused to sign on it are not tax havens. The countries that are refusing to sign are the ones who are saying, well, listen, you are putting these terrible conditions on us agreeing to this deal. You are telling us that we cannot impose any unilateral taxes of our own, like on digital services. You are telling us that we have to subject ourselves to international arbitration, which we know always works against us. So that's the reason why they're not signing on, because the deal is really, in a sense, pitted against developing countries. When you joined the ICR, ICT as co-chair, I'm just going to read a quotation from you. You said, the massive inequalities inherent in the global economic system have been evident for a while, but they have been laid bare and intensified over the past two years with the COVID-19 crisis, the exploding cost of living, and the already devastating consequences of climate change. Is taxation the only way to approach those challenges? Oh, no, there are many, many w w ways we have to fight this because it's a multidimensional crisis. There is, you know, vaccine inequality driven by all the patent regime. There is, but fiscal space is a very important part of it. So the advanced economies, 14% of the global population, have accounted for 80% of additional public spending. Poor countries have spent less than they did after the global financial crisis. And now they're spending even less. They just don't have the funds. And they're facing capital flight as well with monetary tightening in advanced economies. So we have to generate more fiscal space. It's an essential element. It's not sufficient. It's not the only one, but definitely it's essential. During that period of the COVID pandemic and the crises that have sort of followed it, we have seen governments spending unprecedented amounts of money in emergency aid for households and businesses. You and many other economists are worried about this leading to a global debt crisis. Do you think that governments shouldn't have gone down that route? What other solutions did they have? You know, the funny thing is that the countries that are facing debt crises are not the ones who spent that much more. The big spenders were, in fact, the advanced economies, right? 80% of the total spending. The countries that spent a little bit more, 1% of GDP, half a percent of GDP, they are the ones facing the debt crisis because their revenues collapsed and because capital flight has made it worse. So it's not the ones who spent more who are suffering today. It's the ones who have been caught in this uh, incredible sort of tight network of a global debt system in which bond markets play a very powerful role, where any hint of some instability causes a flight out of that country. They're the ones facing a debt crisis. Well, let's talk a little bit more about the problems facing developing countries at the moment. How, how do you balance the solutions that are necessary there? Is it a domestic issue or does the international community have to make this a new focus for itself? I think the international community has to play a role because currently the global architecture is so weighted against developing countries that are trying to do something for their own people. They just don't have the money to give social protection. We have more and more hundreds of millions of people facing absolute hunger, calorie deficiencies over the last two years, and they cannot spend to provide adequate nutrition. They cannot spend to, on health. They cannot spend on basic social services or on protection of any kind. So we desperately need them to get more fiscal space. Why can't they do it? Some of them have massive sovereign debt problems which are not being resolved, pussyfooting around it for two and a half years. Some of them are worried about capital flight because they're embroiled in these global capital markets and the minute their fiscal deficit rises even 1%, capital says, oh, that's terrible and rushes out. And for some of our viewers who don't follow the ins and outs of global finance like that, Explain what you mean by giving more fiscal space to developing economies. So think of it as a ladder. So here's the US and Europe on top, and maybe Japan and a couple of others, and then you keep going down. The countries at the top can do what they like. They can take money out of a hat, right? We have seen trillions and trillions of dollars being spent over the last two years. Money out of a hat, right? Nothing happens. Nobody says, oh, that currency has to depreciate. Nobody says we have to move our capital out of the US. The lower you go down that ladder, you go down, you know, India somewhere in the middle, Ghana worse, Pakistan worse, and so on. The lower you go, the slightest change will cause capital to flee, will make your debts, you know, burgeon because suddenly the borrowing costs will rise dramatically and you will face a crisis like Sri Lanka, for example. You've written a book specifically about the economic fallout of the pandemic in your native India. Do you think this is a possible turning point, for better or worse, for the Indian economy? At the moment, unfortunately, it's for the worse. This 
if the current strategies to deal with it continue, then we are facing a lost generation, not just a lost decade. I am terrified that this is a turning point for the worse. I think it can still be reversed. I think if we change the economic strategy, yes, we can get out of this mess. At the moment, I don't see signs of that. I want to come back to your concern specifically about climate change. Why are more vulnerable people and countries paying a steeper price? That's the irony again, you know, just as the rich world hogged all the fiscal space after the pandemic, they have been hogging all the carbon space over the last 150 years. So, you know, again, something like 85% of the total carbon emissions of the world, same 14% of the world's population, the advanced countries. You can say, well, they started doing it way back a century ago, but most of that, more than half of that was done in the last 30 years when everybody knew it's a problem. Yet, who suffers? People in subtropical and tropical areas, people in where you're facing rising sea levels, where you're facing catastrophic climate change. Look at the floods in Pakistan. Look at the melting of glaciers and the impact it's going to have across Asia. Look at the changing salinity of the soils across so many of these cultivable areas. Look at the new pests emerging in Africa. So the countries that didn't contribute to the problem and cannot afford to deal with it are the ones facing the worst crisis. Jayati Ghosh, thank you so much for joining us today on People and Profit. It's a pleasure, thank you. And thank you for watching. Don't forget you can get in touch with your comments and questions on social media. Bye for now.